Welcome on this second Sunday of Christmas Tide. Today we'll be observing Epiphany, which is always on January 6th. And this is the day the Magi arrived in Bethlehem to worship the newborn Prince of Peace. They brought gifts to honor him. And their arrival from a faraway land reminds us that Jesus came not only to Israel and the Jewish people, but to the whole world that God's Son coming into the world was a, an earth-shaking and, and world-changing event. Jesus came for us all. And my sermon today will be a story with illustrations that is an adaptation of a story called The Story of the Other Wise Man, which was written over 100 years ago by Henry Van Dyke and I'll tell you more about it in a bit. Now, let us worship God. I invite you to join me in the call to worship by reading with the words, by responding with the words on the screen. This comes from the prophet Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Let us pray. Everlasting God, the radiance of faithful souls who brought the nations to your light and magi to the brightness of your rising. Fill the world with your glory, we pray, and show yourself to the nations. We pray through him who is the true light and the bright morning star, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in his name we pray the prayer he taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart, heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. 
They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall be acceptable on my altar, and I will glorify my glorious house. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastlands shall wait for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from far away. There is silver and gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. From the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned, warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is a story called The Fourth Wise Men and was written by Susan Summers and illustrated by Jackie Morris and it was published in 1998. And it's adapted from a story called The Other Wise Men written by Henry Van Dyke who was an English professor at Princeton University. He was a Presbyterian pastor and during World War I he was ambassador to the Netherlands and Luxembourg. And this story is about a fourth wise man, a friend and fellow astrologer to the other three, but for reasons you will see, never made it to Bethlehem. He is presented here as a Zoroastrian, a faith that flourished in the Middle East at the time of Jesus' birth. Astrology and the study of the stars was an important element of this faith. And in this story, we see that Jesus brought to us a universal message that shares the teaching of Jesus with not only the Jewish people of his time, but to all people across the world and across time. In the days when Augustus Caesar ruled the Roman Empire and King Herod reigned in Jerusalem, there lived in the city of Ecbatana, among the mountains of Persia, a man named Artaban. From the roof of his house, Artaban could look out over rising battlements to the hill where the emperor's palace glittered above the city like a jewel. Around his house grew a wonderful garden filled with flowers and fruit trees, watered by rushing streams and made musical by countless birds. High above the tallest trees in the garden stood a tower, and from its window a lamp often shone late into the night, for it was here that Artaban studied. 
Artaban had three friends, Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. And for all four men, knowledge of the stars was the highest form of learning. And one spring night, the four companions were looking up at the sky when they observed a new star shining more brightly than any they had ever seen. The men knew from their studies that this star signified the birth of a great teacher who was to be born among the Jews. There and then, they decided to follow the star. They arranged to meet up together at a place far away by the Temple of the Seven Spheres in Babylon. And from there, they would set out with a caravan of supplies and to follow the star to Jerusalem to pay homage to the child. Quickly, Artaban arranged his affairs. He sold his beautiful house with its fragrant gardens, and he bought three jewels, a sapphire, a ruby, and a pearl to carry as a tribute, a gift, to the newborn child. On the eve of his departure, he said farewell to his old father and knelt to receive his blessing. Before dawn, even before the first bird had awoken, Artaban went down to the stable where Vazda, his favorite horse, stood saddled and bridled in her stall, shaking her bit and pawing at the ground impatiently. He swung himself into the saddle and was soon riding swiftly westward. He had to reach the Temple of the Seven Spheres on the appointed night, and the journey was long and hard. Finally, after ten days and ten nights, he saw before him the great walls of Babylon. At last, in three hours' time, he would be at the Temple of the Seven Spheres. As they trotted past a grove of date palms outside the city walls, Vazda gave a soft whinny and then stood stock still before a dark object lying in the shadow. Artaban dismounted. In the dim starlight, he could see the figure of a man lying across the road. This man needed help, Artaban knew, but how could he stop tonight of all nights? But then he fetched water, mixing it with some of the healing herbs that he always carried. Slowly, he poured the liquid into the sick man's parched mouth. Hour after hour, he poured a little at a time until the man's strength returned. Who are you, the man asked, and why have you taken care of me? I am Artaban of Ekbatana, and I'm going to Jerusalem in search of one who is to be born king of the Jews. And I dare not stay with you any longer, for my friends are waiting and may depart without me. But see, here is all I have left of bread and wine, and here's a potion of healing herbs. The sick man raised his trembling hands solemnly to heaven. May the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob bless you and bring you peace. Now take heed, he said, the Messiah will not be born in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem of Judea. May the Lord bring you in safety to that place, because you have had pity on me and saved my life. It was already near dawn, and Artaban rode quickly across the silent plain. But when he reached the Temple of the Seven Spheres, he could find no trace of his friends. Then, by the edge of a terrace, he saw a little stack of bricks, and under it, a piece of parchment. He picked it up and read, We can delay no longer. We go to find the King of Kings. Artaban stared out across the desert. How can I reach Judea, he asked himself, with no food and a tired horse? I must return to Babylon and sell my sapphire and buy camels and food for the journey. I may never catch up with my friends. Only God knows whether I shall miss the King of Kings because I stopped to help a dying man. So Artaban returned to Babylon, where he sold his glittering sapphire and his beloved horse Vazda in exchange for a caravan of camels. Then he set out across the dreary desert. By day, a fierce heat blistered the earth, 
so that no living thing could move. By night, jackals prowled and barked in the distance, and an icy chill fell over the dunes. But he pressed on, faithfully following the bright new star until, as the sick man had told him, it shone above the village of Bethlehem in the land of Judea. Artaban drew near the village full of hope. Now at last he could give his pearl and his ruby to the king. But the streets were deserted. And then from the open door of a stone cottage, he heard someone singing softly. He entered and found a young woman singing her baby to sleep. Yes, the woman told him three strangers from the east had appeared a few days earlier. They had said that a star had guided them to the place where Joseph of Nazareth was staying with his wife and her newborn son, and they had paid great reverence to the child and given him many gifts. But, she went on, the travelers had disappeared again, and they say the man from Nazareth has fled to Egypt with his family. Suddenly there came a noise of wild confusion in the streets a shrieking and wailing of women's voices, a clashing of swords, and a desperate cry, the soldiers, the soldiers of Herod, they are killing our children. The young woman's face went white with terror. Clutching her baby, she crouched in the darkest corner, covering him with her robe. Artaban stood over, strode over to the doorway, blocking it. When the soldiers reached the cottage, Artaban summoned their captain and said, I'm alone here, and I will give you this jewel if you will leave me in peace. And then he showed the ruby, glistening in his palm like a great drop of blood. The captain's eyes widened with greed, and he grabbed the jewel. March on, he cried as the soldiers left. Artaban quietly prayed, God of truth, forgive my lie. I have said a thing that is not true to save the life of a child. And now two of my gifts are gone. Shall I ever see the king of kings? But from the shadows behind him came the woman's voice saying, because you have saved my little one, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord give you peace, now and always. Artaban left with the woman's blessing and made his way to Egypt, asking everywhere for news of the family from Bethlehem. But he could find no trace of them. By now the star had vanished from the night sky and he had no idea where to continue his search. So he went to a wise old rabbi to seek advice. My son, said the rabbi, our scriptures foretold that the king of kings would be despised and rejected by men. He will not be found in a palace, nor among the rich and powerful. If you seek him, look among the poor and the lowly, the sorrowful and the sick. The years passed and Artaban traveled on, always searching in the poorest places for the family from Bethlehem. He passed through towns where people were crying with hunger. He passed through cities where they were dying of plague. And though he found no king of kings to worship, he found many people to help. Wherever he went, he fed the hungry and clothed the naked he healed the sick, and he visited those in prison. And his years went by more swiftly than a weaver's shuttle that darts back and forth through the loom, while the web grows and the invisible pattern is completed. From time to time, he would stop and take out his pearl, the last of his gifts. And as he gazed on it, he would wonder whether he would ever meet the King of Kings. Thirty-three years had passed since Artaban had first seen the star and set out on his journey. 
and now worn and weary, he traveled to Jerusalem to make one final search. He arrived during the season of the Passover, and the city was thronged with people who had come for the feast. But this year, there was a strange sense of foreboding in the air. All around Artaban, sandals clattered and thousands of bare feet shuffled over the stones as the crowds were swept along to the Damascus Gate. What's happening? asked Artaban. Haven't you heard, replied a young man, there's going to be a crucifixion. Two robbers are to be crucified. And another man, a man called Jesus of Nazareth. They say he has said and done many wonderful things, and everyone loves him greatly. But the priests and the elders say he must be killed, because people are saying that he is the Son of God. Then Artaban knew that this must be the king of kings, for whom he had been searching all these years. His heart thumped and his mind raced. Perhaps if he offered his pearl to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, he might save the man's life. And so he hurried toward the Damascus gate. But just beyond the entrance to the guardhouse, a troop of soldiers came down the street, dragging a young girl with a torn dress and disheveled hair. As Artaban paused to look at her, she broke away from the hands of her tormentors and threw herself at his feet. Have pity on me, she cried, save me. My father was a follower of Zoroaster, and I see from your clothing that you are of the same faith. Now my father is dead, and I am to be sold as a slave to pay for his debts. Help me, please. Artaban looked on the girl and trembled. For a third time, he had to choose between keeping his jewel as a gift for the king of kings or surrendering it to save a fellow human being. Yet he knew that to rescue this helpless girl would be a true deed of love. Artaban took his priceless pearl from its pouch and placed it in the girl's hand. Here is your ransom, daughter. It is the last of the treasures I was keeping for the King of Kings, who is now to be crucified. As he spoke, the sky grew black and tremors ran through the street. Houses rocked, stones fell and crashed into the street. Dust clouds filled the air. The soldiers fled in terror, and Artaban and the girl took refuge beside the wall of the guardhouse. The earth gave one final shudder, and a heavy tile, loosened from the roof, fell and struck Artaban on the temple. As the girl bent over him, fearing that the old man was dead, there came a voice through the darkness, very small and still, like music sounding from a distance. And the voice said, Peace be with you, Artaban. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in distress, you comforted me. As often as you did these things, the least of my children, you did them for me. A calm radiance lit up Artaban's face, and a long, last sigh of relief left his lips. His journey was ended. At last he had found his king. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for your son, for Emmanuel, God with us, our king. Amen.
Our affirmation of faith comes from our Presbyterian Church's A Brief Statement of Faith, which was published in 1983. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Let us pray. Gracious God, our hearts rejoice in your presence as we give you our thanks and praise, for you are the fulfillment of our searching. Now the light has risen, the mystery is made known, your beloved child Jesus is revealed to the whole world as Savior and Redeemer, and as the King who reigns in justice and peace. Eternal God, we thank you on this first Sunday of the year that you have never given up on us. We thank you that even in spite of our tardiness in growing in grace, in Jesus you have welcomed us. We pray that you make our hearts more generous in order that we might forgive those to whom we are so little inclined to want to extend mercy. Help us to release those resentments which we so consistently nurture and tightly embrace. Temper the watchful eye attitude within us which sees so glaringly the offenses and mistakes of our sisters and brothers. Be also with the nations of the world. We are reminded by the behavior of Herod how tenuous is the thread by which power is held, and how the threat of power lost causes people to do what normally would be unthinkable. Be in all of those places where people seek, like the Magi,
to journey to find Jesus, the child of hope. Be with all who follow the bright stars of their lives and look for freedom and for peace. Be with all who live with the threats of reprisal or persecution or danger because of their beliefs. Be with all leaders and temper their power with justice and love. May there be peace and goodwill among all your people. We pray for our friends and families, especially those who are ill, feel alone or afraid, or have lost a beloved person. Especially we pray for those on our church's prayer list. We pray for healing of hearts and minds and bodies, that your love might overpower the power of illness, the power of loneliness, the power of depression and anxiety. Give us all, we pray, rest for our souls. In the name of Emmanuel, we pray. Amen. Go out into the world in peace, rejoicing that Jesus came not only to a particular place at a particular time in history, but came to the whole world and for all time. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Thank you.